During the coronavirus pandemic, many lenders have allowed borrowers to defer their payments. Great. But you know the catch, the interest keeps accruing, but that's not the only issue. There's a lot more to debt deferral than meets the eye, and Ted and I are going to talk about it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. We are recording this on Tuesday, May 19th, the day after Victoria Day, in our deserted head office here in Kitchener, not in the studio. We're still observing so you know physical distancing. We're actually in our boardroom. Uh, we're you know more than six feet apart. So Ted, thanks for making the trip in. Let's get started with the obvious question: Why have you not taken the opportunity in lockdown to grow a beard? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I've got three little girls, and if you ever had a little girl come up to you and say, "Oh, daddy," and give you a little kiss and rub your face, you know that a beard is not a go thing. So there you go. And I I have no little girls, so so I guess that's why. I, I hope have your a beard. sons wouldn't be coming up to no, give you a little smooch on they, the cheek. They don't live with me, so in fact, my oldest has grown a beard of his own. So of course there he you, has. So there you go. So I suspect it will not be lasting much longer. So right. please don't get used to it. So to the to the topic at hand, we're going to discuss the true cost of debt deferrals. Oh wow! So let's get start with the easy stuff. And then we'll, you know, get into the weeds a bit. So I want you to give me an example of the most common type of debt deferral, which would be a mortgage, because all the banks have been advertising it. And that's the one that got the most media play at the start of this whole thing. So let's keep it simple. Uh, $400,000 mortgage, 3.5% interest. So your interest is charging you $14,000 a year. So if you don't have to make a mortgage payment for six months, intuitively you say you're saving $7,000. It's actually, I mean, the amount you're saving is bigger than that because you're also not making any principal payments. So let's start with that number. It's pretty simple. Yeah, so from an interest point of view, and of course, we did that math really roughly. We understand if we punched it into an amortization table, it would come to 6,900 and something, 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 something. Right. So, okay, six months from now then, where are you at? Well, you'd think you'd be at the exact same spot you are today, but you're not, right? Because what their bank is doing is they're giving you a break on making payments, but they're not giving you a break on the cost of borrowing the money. So you end up paying more interest in the long term. And in fact, due to the magical powers of compound interest, you're paying interest on the interest for that six months as well. Yeah. So if I'd made my regular mortgage payment, my $400,000 mortgage would be slightly less than $400,000 the next month and slightly less. So therefore the interest I'm paying. But no, I haven't made any payments on principal. So now your $400,000 mortgage in six months is 400000 plus the interest you haven't paid. So let's call it $407,000. So it's gone up. And now you're paying interest on that extra $7,000 that you weren't paying before. And that's clearly a bit of a problem. So right. the second biggest debt someone would have, a mortgage would be the first. The second yeah. biggest debt would be a car. Makes and sense. car companies are also allowing people to defer because obviously they don't want to be coming and repoing your car because you missed a payment for a month or two. The math is, I assume, somewhat similar in that case, except the interest rate is higher. Yeah. So let's say a $20,000 loan at 5% interest, which is a pretty good deal. Five-year term, your monthly payment's 380 bucks. So two months of deferring payments saves you $760. So saves you in from a cash flow from point a cash of view. flow perspective and that's the that's the dig with all of this yeah, right and that's the whole key that we're talking we're talking cash flow here okay so enough numbers let's go into the practical advice segment here which we normally save till the end but let's just go right to it here yep what should i be thinking about when it comes to should i get a deferral or not and and you know let's let's take the case of the car Okay. So should I defer or should I not? Well, obviously, part of it is, can I afford to? I mean, if I'm not right. working, I have no money coming in that I have to defer. But let's assume I, I could make you know some or all of the payments, but the car company is offering my me a deferral. What's the thought process I should be going through? Well, so when are you going to pay back the deferral? So are you looking for a deferral that says, I'm going to skip these next two months payments and we're just going to add two to the end? So that's definitely going to increase the cost of interest because now you, you're paying interest for that much longer, even though it's only two months. Uh, or are you going to try at the end of those two months to have a balloon payment to catch up everything, which could also be a problem. You got to make sure you understand what terms they're looking for. Are they going to say you can skip these two, but you got to pay three? 
Or are they going to say, you can skip them, we'll put them on the end? Both have consequences. Yeah, and we're seeing car loans now that are many years in length. Oh, they drive me crazy. There's seven and eight year loans now on a vehicle that probably after four years isn't worth a hell of a lot. So if I am in year number one of my car loan and I'm going to take two payments and put them at the end of year eight, that's right. seven years from now. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the principal didn't get reduced for those two months. So for six more years, in my example, I'm paying interest on that amount. So mathematically, that ends up being a somewhat significant number. And again, the the car, it's not as dramatic as the household mortgage, but compounding interest, I bet you're also paying interest on the interest for those two months of deferral for the six years. So what is the thought process then? I'm, I'm, there's the financial end of it. Okay. Right. But. So that's the basic question is first, do you have to keep the car? Um, I know. I mean, I'm a car guy, so I've, you are I'm a car a guy. A little this reluctant to say this, yeah, but I know um, a lot of people should be assessing whether or not the motor vehicle makes sense, or the motor vehicle that they have makes sense. So, if you're not driving to work anymore, and you think in the future you're going to be driving less, does it make sense to keep the car? If it turns out that the car is significantly underwater, so that's a term that we use in the industry to mean that you owe a lot more than the car is worth. Does it make sense to keep the car? Um, yeah, and you're right. We're we're in this brave new world where transition economy. the transition economy <laughs> where a lot of people have been working from home for a couple of months and may end up working from home forever, right? Or maybe they'll end up working from home two or three days a week, going into the office a couple of days a week. Well, then your car becomes much less of a thing, right? So I don't think I have put gas in my car in two months. Well, and I am taking turns which cars I'm driving. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If you have multiple cars, then I guess it's a bit of a, a different issue. Um, <clears throat> so, hmm, do I need a brand new car if I'm going into the office or the, my workplace one day a week? Well, maybe I can get by with something a lot less. Right. So it's not as simple, though, as saying, you know what, instead of deferring my payments, why don't I just give the car back? Right. Well, there are consequences of that too, obviously. So are you going to sell the car privately to try to pay off as much of the loan as possible? Can you actually give it back to the dealer and they'll work out some kind of arrangement for you to pay off whatever balance is left? It depends on how far underwater the car is. And I'm guessing used car values are not going up anytime soon. Probably not, since the market may get flooded with repossessions when all of this sorts itself out. Yeah, so hmm, it's a tough call. Do I return the car now? Well, maybe prices still have a bit of juice left in them, or do I keep making the payments? Do I do the deferral? Our point is these are the things you got to think about now and, right. uh, and, and come up with a plan on it. Okay, so we talked about mortgages. We talked about car loans. The next highest interest rate thing that people would be exposed to would of course be credit cards right and pretty much all the credit card companies have said yep no problem we will give you a break you don't have to make your minimum payment this month well again the math is even worse than in the previous two examples right so let's say a five thousand dollar balance at 20 percent interest uh the interest is costing you 84 dollars a month so in three months you've got to make up your normal payment so you but now you're 250 dollars behind in the interest and again The higher the interest rate, the more dramatic the effects of compounding interest. So back with the mortgage where we were paying, what was it, 3%, 3.5% in our example, the compounding effect is a problem because of the the length of time. With a credit card, the time is not as long, but the interest rate is dramatically higher. 20% is a pretty decent credit card. Their card's out there at 29% and 30%. Yeah, and even if you're only carrying a $1,000 balance, well, 20% of $1,000 is $200. Yep. So it, it certainly adds up. And what happens if when I defer that payment, the interest is still clicking and that puts me over my authorized limit? Sure. Are they going to charge you with over limit fees and all sorts of other things? I don't think anybody has actually published what their policies are in those regards. So what's my thought process then? Do I have to consider other options? I mean, we've talked about returning my car okay well there's some you know potential bad things that can happen with that as well with my credit card if i've still got this massive amount of debt deferring isn't really solving my problem then is right. it well and that's i mean what we're really getting at here folks is that this crisis is making it painfully obvious that a lot of people are carrying a lot more debt than they can afford um, if missing a single paycheck causes you the kind of financial stress that we're seeing then deferring two or three months it's just going to make it all that much worse So maybe instead of deferring, you should be looking at some sort of debt reduction plan. 
Yeah, which is why, and you and I talked about this, I think, in our on our first COVID-19 episode uh, out in our lobby there, where we made the comment that this is the time a lot of people are considering bankruptcies and consumer proposals. Right. And I just had a, a conversation with someone this morning who said, boy, I guess you guys are really, really busy right now. And I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, our the number of bankruptcies and proposals filed in April was down 50% from the previous year. I suspect May will look about the yep. same. Maybe Should June be. will look about the same as well. And the reason, as you and I explained in that podcast, was that, well, the courts are closed. No one's getting sued. Mm-hmm. The collection agents aren't calling or as much. I mean, they're calling, but they're at a, at a reduced level. Revenue Canada isn't taking any collection action. So anybody who owes taxes is okay. So the immediate pressure to file a bankruptcy or a proposal isn't there. Right. Because what are they going to do? And particularly if I'm not working and don't have any wages to garnish. Well, and we're actively counseling people that there is no urgency to doing this right now. The purpose of this conversation, though, is to say, before you decide to sign up for a six-month mortgage deferral or a three-month car deferral or stop making payments on your credit cards, maybe the deferral isn't the correct answer. Maybe you should be looking at these debt reduction plans as an alternative. Yeah, and not necessarily starting it today. Right. But what we're doing with pretty much everyone who calls is say, okay, let's go through the scenario. When are you going to be back to work? What's that going to look like? Right. Well, if you work at a garden center, wow, you're back to work and it's full tilt and, you know, there's lineups outside the door. Right. Even we're recording this on Tuesday, Victoria Day Monday, which in Ontario here was horrible weather, gale force winds, pouring rain. It was, you know, and yet the lineups at the garden centers were, were all the way down the street. So, if you're working there while well, your income has, has come back, right. you're probably closer to, to needing to file something. If you work at a restaurant, eh. Well, you don't know when it's going to come back. And all of this conversion to takeout is not generating any tips. That's right. Which is what the serving staff depend upon. Yeah. So if your situation is, well, I don't really know what's going to happen when I get back. Okay, then you don't need to make that decision right now. You can yeah. wait. The other impact of a deferral is how is it going to impact your credit report? Yeah, and that's a little more complicated. And we don't know. Right. I think the short answer is we don't know. From what I've heard from both Equifax and TransUnion, they've got a special code that they're putting on your credit report, you know, an X or something that says it was deferred. So the payment wasn't made, but you're not penalized for being late. And what they're doing is they're basically saying, we're suspending our reporting criteria. So during this deferral period, we're going to say, well, it was reported that you took advantage of a deferral program. That's, I mean, that's yeah, what those It was an mean. agreed upon thing, so everybody's on side. Yep. Now, what happens if four months from now I'm back to work, my income's come back, and I go to get a loan? Is the lender going to say, oh, okay, you, you never missed a payment, but you deferred one? Is that going to have a negative impact on your ability to borrow? And it's going to depend on how tight monetary policy is at the time. Any kind of excuse they can use to not approve your loan. It's generally the excuse they use, they right? Will, they will probably take it. So I guess our point is we don't know what the complete impact is going to be on your credit report, and we don't know how lenders will interpret that in the future yep. because you're right. If the government keeps the spigots open and interest rates are low and their money is free, well, then I guess you'll have no problem borrowing. Our point is consider all the different ramifications. Right. We're not saying don't defer, but we're saying if you've got high levels of debt, maybe you should be looking at all your options before you make that commitment to defer. So that you you have a, a more global plan. Now, yep. final category of debt. And I know you want to talk about this, so yep. I'm, I've put it on the list here. Thank you. CERB, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's not technically a debt, but it okay. could be. It's going to be, I guarantee. Well, because the CERB is taxable. Right. And so explain what that could potentially mean for me, the the person who has uh, taken full advantage of the CERB. So it's a 16-week program, uh, $500 a week, so that's $8,000. Right. What, what is potentially going to happen to me next year? Well, so the first thing everyone needs to understand, because it is taxable, means you should be paying taxes on it. But the government's not deducting any taxes. They are simply giving you the money because you need it. So... Every one of these $500 per week checks that you're getting, you should be thinking, well, $100 of that is probably income tax I'm going to have to pay in the spring. So the example you were just giving, um, let's say a person normally makes less than $500 a week. Maybe they're a part-time worker or they're a seasonal worker or what really doesn't matter. And so the CERB income is actually going to increase their tax rate versus what they would normally pay. So again, 
they're going to need to have set aside some money for the taxes. Well, what about the folks that as soon as they get back to work, they're going to have all sorts of crazy overtime because the work has to get done anyway. Well, now the SERB benefit, which they needed at the time, is going to increase their taxable income again. Yeah, and, and we have a progressive tax system, which means the higher your income, the higher the percentage that you pay. Right. So the lowest tax bracket is, you know, roughly 20% in Ontario, roughly 15% federal, 5% provincial. But, I mean, you you can figure out exactly what your tax rate is by looking at your 2019 tax return right. and what was your total income, what would you pay in tax, divide the two, there you go. Right. So 20% for someone who is working is probably the the low number. It could be obviously as high as 50%. Right. And so you're right. I, I went, you know, on all year at the 20% rate. Then I had CERB, which had no taxes taken off. Then I go back and I start working all this overtime. So by the end of the year, my overall tax rate ends up being 30%. Right. Well, if I got eight thousand dollars on CERB and I owe thirty percent in tax, twenty four hundred bucks. I'm going to owe twenty four hundred bucks next year. When I'm used to getting a refund, right? So it's not just that you owe the money; you're used to getting money back. So it's a double whammy. Yeah, and if my refund is normally a thousand, well, I guess I'm going to get you know I'm going to owe you know twenty four hundred or twenty six hundred or, right. or whatever the whatever the number is. Yep. So. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to be saving for that now? I mean, I, I needed the CERB because I had to pay my rent. I'm kind of caught. Like, there is right. no right answer here, is yeah. there? So unless the government does something to somehow waive all of those things and they can't afford to keep doing this forever, uh, you've got to put a plan in place to deal with the taxes. Yeah. And, and as, again, we're recording this after Victoria Day. So my guess is that the feds are not going to extend the CERB. But Probably I don't know. Yep. I don't know. I think what they're going to do is extend the the wage subsidy because mm -hmm. they're saying, OK, go back to work. We're going to give your employer some money to cover your wages. And that's best for all parties concerned. Right. The optics are better. The optics are better. And, you know, it, it gets people back to work. My big concern is the feds have been floating these the word fraud. You know, oh. the, the finance minister, the prime minister have said, you know, if you're not eligible, you should not be applying and you should be getting it back. Now, of course, when it first came out, everyone's like, you know what, I could be losing my job tomorrow. So I'm making sure I apply. Right. We know it's the government. We don't know how long it's going to take. I better apply. Right. So some people applied who thought they were eligible and perhaps ultimately weren't. Perhaps they ended up getting called back to work or whatever. So it stands to reason that there will be some people who got it who weren't eligible. Certainly. So I assume then that the government is going to do something to see if they can recover that money. Well, I mean, the, the initial response is going to be you simply you end up declaring it on your taxes and you're going to have a tax hit. The question is, where are they going to draw the line with how much you owe us, how much you received? Do we think there was something more involved? Did you do it on purpose? Well, and so if you were the government and you had to, to figure that out, it's, I mean, there have been, I don't know, seven or eight million people who have applied for the CERB. So it's a, would be a pretty big auditing exercise to do it. Yep. However, in order to qualify for the CERB, you were supposed to be working and then you weren't able to be working. Right. Which means you got laid off from your job. Mm -hmm. If you get laid off from your job, you get an ROE. And your ROE lists on it, here's all my income for the last, you know, X Period number of, time. of periods. Yeah. So it wouldn't be that hard for a computer program to go, okay, let's compare the ROE to your your CERB. Yep. If there was no ROE, did that mean you kept working? Right. There's the first flag. So, okay, Mr. Mm -hmm. Taxpayer or Mr. You know, applicant, you got to send us copies of your pay stubs. Now, maybe you were self-employed. There was no ROE. Right. Okay. But- it wouldn't be that hard for the government to say, send us copies of your pay stubs. Or if you're, if you're, were employed, if you're self-employed, send us copies of your income. And even if they don't actually look at it, it's a pretend audit. Yep. Just the fact that people know they're looking may make them say, okay, I guess I better pay this back so that there's, there's no penalties. So it could, it might not just be the tax implication. It could be the, the, whole the entire thing. So, yep. okay. So let's wrap this up then, then with, the big picture is if I'm thinking about getting a deferral, okay, you're probably going to get it if it's right. being offered, but yep. the things to think through are what? So how much extra interest is it going to cost you? So what are you really, what's the deferral really cost and what's the repayment plan for it? So again, are you adding payments to the very end of your contract? Are you required to make a balloon payment in two or three months? 
what's it's saving your cash flow today. What's it going to do to your cash flow tomorrow? And and look to the future. And I think yep. if you do get a deferral, get the deal in writing. Obviously. Because you don't want to have a phone call where they say, yeah, okay, don't worry. You don't have to make your payment this month. And then as a result, your car gets repoed next month because you didn't make a payment. So right. and I'm not saying you need a formal legal document, but an email or something I think would uh, would be uh, not a bad thing. Consider, obviously, the impact on your credit score. Yep. And then the final point, is this deferral just a Band-Aid? Right. If I have $50,000 worth of credit cards, bank loans, payday loans, taxes, whatever, and I'm deferring a few hundred dollars until next month, is my situation going to be any different next month? And if the answer is, well, no, then I got to look at a bigger picture solution then. Right. And so you should be talking to somebody possibly about a consumer proposal or even bankruptcy. I mean, before all of this COVID business started, uh, we were ridiculously busy. So people were already recognizing that we were in trouble. All these years of really low interest rates made us all credit addicts. We've got all we've got more debt than we can handle. COVID has given you everybody a breathing space. Um, when this all corrects itself, we're going to go back to being very busy. And we're just trying to encourage people to look at all your options now. Don't leave it till the last minute and don't leave it till somebody's pressuring you to do something. You've got the time now to research your solutions. Look at all the options. Maybe a consumer proposal makes sense. Yeah, and we are talking to people on the phone by yep. video conference. So even though our offices are closed in-person meetings, we're still here. And so, in fact, we've got the time. You've got the time because you're, <laughs> you're either not working or working from home or whatever. So I think, yeah, what what will the situation be when I get back to work? Right. And if I'm, that's not going to solve my problems, then you might as well start uh, start dealing with them now. Makes sense. Excellent. That's a good way to end it. Ted, thank you very much for being here. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Next week is podcast episode number 300. So yeah, I'll have something a little bit special for you. So you want to tune in for that. So until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. For Ted Michaelis, that was Debt Free in 30.